Alright, another draft physics video presentation. Yeah, I'm not really in the center, am I? It doesn't really matter, but I could fix that. So I did. Uh, anyway, comments again. Uh, for, for start off with x rays and uh, other details about photons. Uh, yeah, so I'll read the comment and then we'll get to relativity, hopefully, a video with more of that. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Anyway, uh, have you considered what the pattern would be if the energy, I really hate that concept, so I'm just letting you know, um, photons all are made of stuff that has the same energy. And so if you're going to say the amount or the frequency, I'm okay with that because that's all you're really saying, a higher frequency. That is, you're putting more in a specific amount of time. But to say it's higher energy is, that gets into this whole de Broglie mistake of associating momentum with um, frequency. And that's um, deceptive, in my opinion. It doesn't get to the truth. Uh, associated with the photon was increased. So he's just saying increasing the frequency. Uh, is it possible that the pattern is influenced by energy variations from photon to photon? Well, obviously the pattern is influenced in the sense that the higher the frequency of the light, the smaller the little nodes get and the more compressed they are. So you're automatically going to get more wavelengths in the distance you know, between the two surfaces. Obviously, if I have a higher frequency, I can get more wavelengths in between that distance. That means more bars. That means smaller bars. <laughs> that means it's going to be hard to see. So, um, soft x-rays would be around 10 nanometers. Um, 5, you could even say. And uh, if you use 500 for the nanometers of visible light, you could say it's uh, 100 times more um, smaller. So that's all you're saying is is that well if i reduce the size of the slits they're already really small but if i make them a hundred times smaller i can do an x-ray uh, pattern and sure they probably have done it <laughs> okay um uh energy variations from photon to photon well obviously the photons always come that way and especially something like x-rays it's very hard to send monochromatic x-rays that is x-rays of just one frequency so I don't even know if they have any technology that can actually do that without just filtering out x-rays. Um, so, you yeah. know, in other words, maybe um, subtle differences in energy between different photons influence the occurring pattern. I know it's more of an influence as I thought about it. So we'll go to the video. I mean, we'll go to the camera. Uh, this one, right? Yeah, that's the one. All right. Yes, yes, I should pause and not do this kind of noisy, uh, you know, figure out what position to be in and blackboard and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you, you can handle it. People, I think you can. And certainly I should always have these marks on here so I know where I'm allowed to go, uh, <laughs> where I'm allowed to draw. Um... So I was thinking about when you make a, a slit uh, experiment, the real trick is is that this distance, as I was saying before, to be precisely, uh, you know, an even number of wavelengths, you know, or odd, I mean a whole number, you know, to have exactly five wavelengths worth, you know, so 2,500 nanometers, let's say, you know, 2,500 nanometers of a distance it's a very delicate thing and so obviously these surfaces could be a little irregular you know they could have a little bit of irregularity in them and so that's going to mean that there's going to be places where you know you're more than the distance is actually a little bit more than uh, five perfect wavelengths and a little bit off just a half wavelength off means a great deal of difference in terms of what's being sent where the on photon is and that would account for the fact that it's very hard, I have never seen the the perfect scenario where the two, um, you know, uh, on-off patterns are overlapping somewhere short of their midpoint, because it would be a millimeter short of that. 
um, but that would be the smallest center maxima you could get in the single slit experiment. And I've never seen that actually in a pattern. And it just might be because it's really hard to get this just so, just so perfect. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> so that's not exactly your point, but uh, it's part of the story, I'd say. Uh, almost went too high there, didn't I? Yeah, uh, come down a little. <laughs> yeah, around here. All right, anyway. Um, so you can barely see that too. So I gotta make it a little, draw a little thicker. Um, oh, I should use my not to get your hands dirty pen. Uh, so where was I? All right, so all we're really talking about is the frequency of the light here. So we're just talking about, I'm arguing the light is made of nodes of quanta. Okay, I don't care what you call them, force bits. They're moving the speed of light. The polarization is represented by the fact that the bits are not moving in exactly the same bit of space, but they are moving parallel to each other. And that would be its polarization. And they're just bullets, frankly. Uh, can be understood just as bullets. Well, that really isn't good enough. <laughs> you gotta make it, gotta draw bigger, I guess, uh, with this uh, lighting. I thought it was good enough. Of course, I thought so, but anyway. Um, all right, so the, the point I want to get to, all right. So we have two phenomena that take place when you hit a surface with light, right? So there's the phenomenon of what is called the, uh, the um, um, photoelectric effect. You know, and an electron flies off at a certain velocity. All right, and so if I hit it with x-rays, I get more velocity, a lot more velocity. I hit it with ultraviolet light, I get less velocity, but I still get electrons flying off the surface. Uh, if I hit it with infrared, lower frequency, nothing bounces off the surface. But I can still get the photoelectric effect in the sense that I can get a current. Okay, I can get, you know, a plus and minus current. So these are two, there's one thing, and they're, they're calling it the same thing. I mean, this is sort of called the photoelectric effect for obvious reasons, you know, a photovoltaic cell. Well, a photovoltaic cell is going to react to, to you know, even, even, even energy in the infrared. Well, yeah, I won't say that for sure. Uh, it, it certainly can do red light, okay? You can see it. It gets energy out of it. Um, and it gets more electricity the higher the frequency, but I'm just saying those are two different effects, really. One, the creating electricity here is one effect. Creating electricity here, that is creating electrons that are gonna shoot through the plasma, or, you know, some, you know, space. Uh, that's a whole different thing, right? <laughs> right? I mean, that's a, that's a very different effect. So, um, you know, and it's actually physical electrons flying off the surface all right but you know i'm just saying so um what i would say to understand this is where i'm heading anyway in my understanding of what the phenomenon is as i've sort of pointed out um well, as i overtly have pointed out if you took an electron in space it's getting hit by energy from all directions theoretically if it's an empty space now let's just say i hit it with one more, and, and my point is, is that the mechanism is, you know, that's really, I should pause and try to fix that. See if I can fix that. I'll be back. Well, we'll try that. Let's see if that's better. Um, all right, so the electron's being exposed to energy. And my point is, is that for it to move, what's really happening is energy hits it and it sticks. All right? And the little force bit came this way and the matter bit will move it'll move slower than the speed of light because it's bigger and the force bit can't push it any faster than that and um, then it'll move a certain amount of space till something hits in the opposite direction so something with a vector in the opposite direction hits you know something coming this way and these two will reflect that one will reflect this one will reflect and this will stop and that's basically how matter moves through space. So the implication of that is, is that if you took that sort of seriously, if I just add one more tiny piece of it, so the energy's hitting it, the universe is hitting it, and the little electrons just wobbling around, you know, 
goes a little bit one way, stops, ends up going the other way, it all averages out and it just ends up jiggling in space. But if I add just one extra bit of force, so say this direction, and you know, we'll put an arrow over here just to make it even, um, I just add one little extra bit coming this way, then the electron is going to remember that. It can't erase it happening. So until a little extra bit comes from this way, the electron will basically move, stop, and when it's jiggling now, and it will go this way again, and then stop, and then go this way again. It's, yes, it's jiggling in these other directions all the time also, but over time it will keep processing, so to speak, through space in that direction until an extra bit comes from this side of the universe. So until something coming this opposite way, until it gets a little extra bit from this somewhere, from the opposite direction, it will just tend to move in that direction. Now, the interesting fact is, uh, if you understand that concept as being the, a way that the universe could be understood, um, you would, couldn't understand that if you have that extra bit here and it hits, and then you have another one hit, right, from this side, and another one hit from this side, extra bits, and you don't have any extra bits coming from the other direction, well then what you'd actually have is you'd have those three would still always sort of be here. You know, they'd sort of, um, you can't undo their effect. So you could think of them just as piling on, so to speak. And their, the consequence is going to be that this would say, say with one guy pushing, the electron travels one-tenth of the speed of light. And with two extra bits going in this, with a component in that direction, it goes, you know, one-ninth, uh, and then one-eighth, <laughs> and then, you know, it just piles up. So it ends up going faster and faster the more bias it's had from this side of the universe. So the more hits it gets from this side of the universe, without there being an extra hit, so to speak, from the other side to stop it, it will gain speed and, um, you know, end up going faster, which means it can go farther in the same amount of time. So, the simple ex explanation for these photoelectric effects are that the higher energy light, as you put it, okay, it is going to end up hitting more than once, you know. So it's going to be more likely that an electron is going to get hit more than once. If it gets hit more than once, it's going faster, which means it'll go further away from, say, its proton over here that's holding it in an atom. It's more likely to be pushed further, okay, and the further it's and faster. So it's going to be going faster, which means it's going to cover more distance in the same amount of time, and therefore, it's going to end up blah, 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 um, uh, overcoming, well, since you brought up drag, this drag ultimately will destroy that energy. So a little bit of a time, because you're moving faster into more energy in the direction you're moving. So I should have pointed that out. So it is not like it's inevitable, it goes forever. The energy is undone by the fact that once you give this thing velocity, it's moving into more energy than behind it is hitting it. And so now it's not in the same amount of energy. But the point is, is while this happens, this is happening before the field can impose enough drag to stop it. So before the drag stops it, it's moving fast enough to be kicked out. So the idea with x-rays is, is that you end up getting, you could collect more than one of these little extra force bits you're moving the electron faster, which means you have a more likelihood of ejecting it from the atom. So the faster you move it, the more it moves in a certain amount of time, and the more opportunity it has to leave the proton. And the less uh, force bits you collect, the less momentum, the less likelihood you're flying out. Now you're still moving, which means you're going to create electricity. And the electricity would sort of be a consequence, so again, you could argue but the whole reason why frequency doesn't matter in one respect, <coughs> except for this, <coughs> the momentum of the electron. 
how fast it's go. Boom. <coughs> Pause again. To... All right, I'm back. Just sneeze too. Allergies, I suspect. <coughs> Chalk. And maybe. Um. Anyway. So it's the speed of the electron <coughs> that's making the difference. But I could argue, let's say this was just, we're talking about a pushing force. So here's energy coming in, photonic. And let's say I change the frequency. Well, the idea would be <coughs> is if, if what the frequency means is you're pushing the electron along, and then you hit it, you know, it's here. And this photon, because it's polarized, that means it's not hitting at the same location every time. The first bit hits here, and the second bit, because of the polarization, hits when the electron's here. And then the third bit hits when the electron is here, right? So that would create polarization, right? So if I drew this as what it would look like in space, you could understand that it would be, this was the last guy, right? This was the second guy, right, here. And this was the third guy here. This was the first guy, and that would be the frequency of the light. So you could sort of understand that the light comes in and it's really the polarization <coughs> is going to be in the same location that this force would be at. You know, with this, if this was a moving object, you could understand that it hits it at the right time because this is moving some, so such a short distance at a enough speed that, you know, that works out. And so if I increase the frequency, it doesn't change how far this thing is rolled, so theoretically, how far it's gone. And how far it's gone can really just be represented as this object moved. <coughs> and if I assume a force between it and the next object, I could just say, well, and that force moved the speed of light and moved this object. And then that force moved the speed of light and moved this object. So the object's always going to be in the right position for the timing of the frequency. So it's like you're pushing something by continually hitting it. But you're not really hitting the same object. You hit this object, it pushes this object, then you hit this object a second time while it's moving this way. And then you hit it a third time, right, while it's moving this way twice. And now you add the third bit. So now if you can get that third bit and hit that third time, then you have enough energy to kick it out of the um, atom and create the ion. Um, and if you don't hit that third time, you still have the motion, which is a current. You still have electrons jumping, moving in each atom in a sequence, which is the current. All right. Oh, that was probably below. Yeah, it was. Well, whatever. You get the idea, I think. Uh, hopefully. <coughs> so... Uh, yeah, I'll just go back to reading and uh, see what else has to be pointed out. Yeah, now I got a runny nose. Just uh, this, this is a tough video. All right, should be back. Uh, so it ends. Uh, what happens if we use <coughs> a photon from an x ray for a double slit experiment? So the simple explanation is your slit has to be a hundred times smaller, okay, to have it be relevant in terms of confining photons, that is, breaking enough of them by percentage. Obviously, if the slit's very wide, you'll let so much light through, you won't be able to see any pattern. And the wider it is, the smaller the bars are, so the less likely is you're going to see them either. Obviously, if you make, you have to make it a very narrow, but 100 times smaller opening, which is difficult. And then, you know, on top of... <clears throat> the difficulty of doing that with any um yeah that's about it i mean that's the only real limiting factor and the fact is though your pattern is also going to be 100 times smaller so you have to view it at a much larger distance if you're going to be able to see anything and so that makes it another part that's tricky the other part is tricky it's really x-rays we don't have you know we, we can't see their color so to speak we can't see like i said it's hard to make monochromatic so the pattern's going to get really messy if you allow more than one frequency of x-rays into the slit. So that's the other limiting factor, right? If you can't monochromatic <coughs> it and there's no color, that is, you don't see the difference between red, blue, um, 
then the pattern is going to get so ugly because the over, they're going to overlap. The different frequencies of the x-rays are going to overlap their patterns on top of each other. So you're just going to get a white line. It's going to be so, the pattern is going to be so bad, so distorted by the fact that you have different frequencies in the experiment that there's little hope you'll get a pattern you can recognize. Uh, yeah, I think it's a pretty complete answer. All right, well, this comment is a lot of, uh, you know, personally hold my hand and take me through. Um, I have subject videos in a playlist called Subjects. Um, they're ranked by most recent ones made, so watch those because those are probably the ones that are going to be the most accurate. And, um, you know, you got to watch a couple of those to get this idea. I mean, I, you know, it's very different than conventional physics. Everything in conventional physics, in my opinion, for the last hundred years, they haven't gotten a single answer right. <laughs> okay, so it's all wrong. Anyway, I'm very interested in your theories. I don't know a theory. It's a theory. But anyway, uh, but I do not know much about book physics. Well, that's a disadvantage. <clears throat> when you say node, well, I made it clear in the video when I said node, you know, so I, I mean, I'm using the word because I have to call it something, right? The fringes are fringes, okay? <clears throat> Fringe seems like a kind of silly thing to be calling them because there's two kinds. There's the space that's no photon and the space that is a photon. And theoretically, those two spaces are representing essentially the nodes of a wavelength. I mean, how else can I, you know, <clears throat> but I mean, I said it pretty clear in the video, okay, that, you know, the word node is just representing the fact. I, I, you know, I'm sorry, but <clears throat> I said it in the video. I mean, I did. You know, and I, and you could just watch the video twice if you don't understand something. You know, but I'll do this just because you know. Yes, yes. The little students have questions. I really don't want to play lecturer student games, but whatever. If that's what I have to do, okay. I mean, I made it clear, right? I mean, their theory is this, right? Now, this even has freaking what you'd call nodes. I mean, they're. This is a wavelength. This is a wavelength. This is a wavelength. I mean, it's a node. It's a node. It's a node. They call the little points where there's intersections nodes. I would call the point, the, the blob, the node. Okay, in between the nodes is a node. But the point is, is this creates an on-off pattern. Okay, light, no light. Light, no light. Now, the trick is also that when you see this pattern in the real world, the light bars are bigger okay then the off bars so there's obviously some bleeding into the off portion of the wave okay now obviously i don't believe it's a wave i believe it's something entirely different and so there should be bleeding because you can be a little bit off the phase can be a little bit off and it's still going to be a photon anyway um, and what I'm saying is, is that there's a center here, and a center here, and a center here, and a center here, and a center here. Those would be the nodes. So this would be the on node, if, if you fairly represent it. And then you'd have the off node, and be, oh, it'd be the, they'd be the same size as nodes. Okay, so when you node it, you're really just saying I'm going to convert it into what it should be, which is they should all be equally sized. All right. Um, and <clears throat> so this is the off portion of the mathematics. This is the on portion of the mathematics. This is the off portion. This is the on portion. That kind of thing. And that's what I mean by node. So you're going to have a pattern. It's going to have ons and offs and ons and offs and ons and offs and the fact is there's only a certain number of them because frankly this is happening in space and the space is you know equidistant space and it's traveling through the space and it's already happened here at the surface and it just travels through space the on travels through space the on travels through space the on travels through space and it's just creating nodes on nodes off nodes on nodes off nodes um so that's what i meant by node <sighs> <Okay. clears throat> 
in phase, out of phase, in phase, out of phase. Reconstruction of a photon, no reconstruction of a photon. <clears throat> All right, when you say no, are you referring to the clumps of photons? No. I haven't watched all your videos, <clears throat> and I need to be brought up to speed. We haven't watched any of them, is what you should have said, right? Okay. <laughs> I have a new subscriber. Well, very exciting. So, the clumps of photons. So, again, it, you know, what, what do you want me to say? The bits inside of the photon are little bullets. Now, if I have a group, if I shoot you a group of bullets at you, bang, 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 bang. Now, there's four bullets I shot. I could call that a clump of bullets, right? Or I could call it a photon. I mean, I mean, what's the, you know, <clears throat> I'm saying that the, the thing is made out of four bullets. You have to hit the surface with four bullets to knock something over, let's say. You're tipping something, you want to knock it over, so you're shooting the four bullets. You need four bullets to knock it over. That's what makes it a photon, It's the fact that you say you need four of them. They're flying through space, okay? So... What part do you want me to explain? The word photon was always a misnomer. We shouldn't have used the word photon for something that's a timed event. It happens over a period of time. It's not a pie in your face. You could even argue a pie in your face isn't a pie in your face, right? If I put whipped cream on top of the lemon pie, the event of you getting a pie in your face, well, you get the whipped cream first, and then you get the lemon pie, and then you get the dish hits you in the face. I mean, it's more complicated than just clump. All right, um, so clumps of photons. <clears throat> so the clumps of photons that hit the edge, so why can't we just use the bullet analogy, okay? So the stream of bullets goes towards the slit. It's near the surface. Some of the bullets plow into the surface because they're a little bit out of alignment. Some of the bullets hit a little lump in the surface. We'll call it an electron. And they're deflected. That's the analogy. Nothing more complicated than that. So what's coming out is a bunch of bullets that got deflected. The ones that went near the surface deflected. The ones that went right through the middle had no problem. They went right to the screen. No problem. That's why most of the light is dead in the middle. 90% of the light hits within you know, a small space of the middle. All right, where was I? Okay. Um, so the clumps of photons that hit the edges of the slit scatter and deflect. Yes. The bullets deflect in all directions. Okay, that causes, well, in all directions in the sense of mostly this way and that way because of how the electrons are being hit. They're being hit this way. That's the major energy. They don't go flying up and flying down as much as they go left and right because they're stuck on a surface. So they tend to swing towards the surface, which means they tend to scatter on that plane that dimensional plane. Uh, that causes the <coughs> radiating wave formulations depicted in the single slit. No. There's no radiating wave formations necessary. The bullets aren't in any wave formation in this beyond the fact that the wave formations can be a, a representation of their phase. The bullets don't lose any speed. They're not hitting and then wobbling and moving slowly and all that kind of crap. They have an interaction. The interaction might take a, a tiny fraction of a bit of time. So they might be out of phase slightly, but only slightly. And that's to their advantage in a sense. But they're moving the same speed, let's assume. So yes, they always have the same place in space because you fired them one second at a time. So they go into the experiment fired one second at a time. They come out of the experiment going in different directions, but still one second at a time intervals. All right. Um, that causes the radiating way... Oh, I already read that horrible sentence. Um, <laughs> uh, in the single slit experiment diagrams. Well, again, the diagrams are a lie because they're not mathematically sound. So... Um, 
Yes, you can visualize it that way, but you have to put those wave centers in the right locations for it to be mathematically sound. And if you put them in the right locations, they're not rational. Waves couldn't be created with centers on the surfaces. That's not where the wave would create a center. So it is just photons deflecting in rays. Well, they went in as rays, they come out as rays, they always exist as rays. There's no fucking, oops, ether. There's no goo. There's no mush. Okay? The photons are independent little, the little bits inside the photon. The photon's a composite object of five or six, seven bits. And those bits are independent agents. They're not tied to each other. They don't know what each other's doing. They don't give a fuck what each other's doing. And so what you're doing is reconstructing photons. You're taking a bit from one photon, taking a bit from another photon that went to completely different locations. And because you're changing their path length difference to a location, you're putting them back in phase or you're putting them out of phase. Uh, but since they are clumps, they... <clears throat> detect bits readily. They de deflect bits readily. I'm just saying scatter is an already known concept. It might be one thing that physics gets right. The concept that uh, photons scatter off of electrons. It's the most fundamental, one of the most fundamental processes in physics is the interaction between photons and electrons. Now, they don't really understand it in the sense that they think a whole photon pops out of one electron, which is really stupid. All right, <clears throat> not being sarcastic or anything, you know, just annoying. Uh, just sincerely curious. So I know you're sincerely curious in the, you know, I'm important. You need to personally convince me. I don't really want to read the book. Tell me the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little annoying. I mean, if every writer had to go to everybody's house and they said, oh, I don't really want to read that book. Could you just tell me what it says? Uh, yeah, that'd be a little annoying, wouldn't it? And went to, I want to know more. Thanks for the lessons. Yes, well, you ought to listen to them. And then I don't have to redo them. Okay, and so you are saying when a wavelength, <laughs> you know, he concludes and then starts over again has a remainder. I'm not saying the wavelength has a remainder. I mean, again, I stated it kind of clearly in the video. I really shouldn't have to do this twice. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not reading. Uh, I'm showing you the board instead of showing you the same interesting comment. Um, there's a distance between the two surfaces. Okay? <clears throat> See? A distance. This is called a source, okay? A point source is what it's actually going to be. And what it is is just a combination of what happens on the surface. And what happens on the surface is electrons are going to deflect photons in both directions. And some of them are actually going to bounce off of here and hit over here and then fly off. So there's going to be all kinds of scattering taking place uh, with the photons that go by the surface, right? So the little photons come in. Okay, they go near the surface, they're going to get all screwed up and head off in all kinds of directions. But yes, the bullets will still have a, a consistency to their distance in space. They were still bullets fired at a frequency. A frequency went in and a frequency is going to come out. And all you're really saying is, can I take bullet two from over here, you know, send it over here. All right, now it becomes bullet four because this is a longer line. So this one sends bullet one, two, and three, and this one sends bullet four, that kind of thing. All right. Um, <clears throat> but this distance, okay, so, so you're saying when a wavelength has a remainder, there's no when a wavelength has a remainder, you're, you're merely taking the wavelength, 500 nanometers, and dividing it into this distance between the sources. The distance between the sources is creating the whole effect. <laughs> this distance. And when you do that, if you have a remainder, a 0.4 remainder, that means when you start the pattern from this side, or you start the pattern from this side, the pattern of constructive, that is, 
reconstruction of a photon, the place where the bright is going to be, is going to be 0.4 away from this location, this straight line to this point source and this straight line to this point source. So the first place is going to be dark and the bright won't start till here. And the argument is, is that this center bright, if I could draw this to scale, this center bright created by the laser beam shooting out and diverging is going to fill in this dark. So this dark will become a bright, this will add to it, that will add to it, and it'll make the big maxima that you see. Well, you can't see all of that, but whatever. Oh, you can't even see it. Very nice drawing. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah. You have to fill in some parts with your own imagination. It's good practice. All right. Uh, all right. Has a remainder that determines the offset for those two nodes. No. So what it determines is what, the, how, where the pattern starts. What it starts with, whether it starts with an off or it starts with an on. That's what it's going to determine. The real pattern. The, the two vectors going towards the middle are fake. It's not a real node. It's inside of a tiny, tiny distance. It doesn't exist as a real node. The one that matters is here and here, the distances of, between the two surfaces. Those are the real starting points, and those starting points can be completely on or start with completely off. That's the catch. If it's an odd number of wavelength, if it's not an, if it's not a a whole number of wavelengths that fit in the distance, then it's automatically going to be some part of the off node that you're beginning with. <sighs> okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, nodes look like one node because they are overlapping. Okay, yes. Well, that part is correct. So, <clears throat> the nodes can overlap because it's really two distinct patterns. There's vectors going this way and creating a pattern, and vectors going this way creating a pattern. So there's two different patterns, essentially. It's not just one pattern being displayed. It's really being displayed by the photons that scattered right and the photons that scattered left. And it's an important distinction. Okay. Uh, say the wavelength were even, then they would be full on and appear as one node. Well, no, they won't because they're separated by a millimeter, and that's just telling you where the centers will be. So the centers are already a millimeter off, so it can't really completely overlap. So it'll be a little bit bigger than a full node because its two halves are going to overlap, and you still have this half and this half. So you still have three halves. You have the two halves that overlapped and you still have this half over here and this half over here. So you're already going to have something that's more than one and a half because you have three halves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you do. All right. I think I'm following here, but I'm unsure if I have digested everything you mentioned properly. Well, yeah, well, it's not it's, it's physics for fuck's sake. There's a lot of moving parts here. There's a lot of experiments to put into context. The, the motion dynamics, again, I could go into more and more detail about the drag and about this and about that. There's lots of factors. I'm giving you a general idea so you understand that this mechanics can explain the experiment. You don't need entanglement. You don't need woo. You don't need superposition. You don't need particles that don't know where they are. You don't need Copenhagen. You don't need many worlds. You don't need any of this nonsense. There's a simple explanation that works perfectly. All right. So, that's enough of that. All right, so on to this other link he sent. So he put a link in here to this, this silly video explaining x-rays, and it was really made for two-year-olds. So if you don't know what frequency is, and you don't know what wavelength is, and that they're the same fucking thing, oh, maybe you should watch that. But maybe you shouldn't, because frankly, they don't even point out how, well, it's just the same measurement, just done with the other side of the ruler, so to speak. 
The wavelength is the frequency. There's no other way to look at it. It's the period. Those are all words for exactly the same thing. Ugh. Anyway, so that was really bad. Now, this video is bad, and it's slow, and it's retarded, and it's going to take forever to get through it, but <clears throat> what it does is just so bizarre that it's worth talking about. And understanding what gravity is, again, it's just not that complicated that, you know, the gravity is always there. All you're really saying when you see gravity, when you notice gravity, is that you have created an imbalance in the energy. So the energy is always there. <clears throat> it's just that you create an imbalance in it. And that's when you notice, hey, gravity. Um, and, uh, you know, the whole relativity thing is just silly. But we'll get to that part. All right, so let's go to the videotape, and I am ready to draw if I must, and such. To understand how gravity affects the flow of time, consider the following. So they start off with this notion of the flow of time, and somehow time is broken, and it's not just breaking clocks. These clocks are atomic clocks. They're just talking about what radioactive elements do when you give them momentum. They have no proof that any normal clock, or certainly your biological clock, will behave the same way. They have no evidence that atoms are going to do it. Uh, every atom does the same thing as a radioactive isotope. No, no, no. No evidence. So this is what it does. It just does this forever. If you are inside a falling box, you will feel weightless as if there is no gravity present. All right, so understand the simple argument is it's, it's, <clears throat> there's different ways for me to apply force to you, right? So, I mean, this is such a, okay, oh, I forgot I have to switch the cameras. Uh, I'm sorry, a little pause. A little musical interlude, blah, 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 so as I've attempted to point out, there's lots of ways for force to interact with you. Now, the little tiny photon bits could interact with you, or um, you know, a bullet can interact with you, or a brick wall can interact with you. You know, you know it's blah 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 blah. Bigger and bigger things could hit you. They can hit more of your surface. They can hit your surface in different ways. Gravity is a nuclear force. It's very made of little tiny stuff. So you don't feel gravity ever okay ever you never feel gravity it doesn't matter whether you're in an imbalance or not right so the point is is i can put you in a in a field that's imbalanced of gravity all right so there's all there's four things coming one way only three things coming this way so obviously you would move towards <coughs> um you know the direction of the less force this force is hitting you more this force is hitting you less and the trick is it's doing it with these tiny, tiny little objects, these little tiny raindrops of, of influence. And the little raindrops, some of them are going right through you. They're so small. Okay, they just plow right through you. But they're moving all of your matter, essentially. I mean, every little bit is being pushed. Every electron and proton is being pushed quite evenly. So you don't feel it because there's no parts left behind. Okay, you feel... Uh, when I push on your feet, because your feet move, but your stomach doesn't. You know, the outside of your skin will move, and this will move, and that, your spine will move, but your stomach doesn't move. So you can feel it happening. You can feel that queasiness, or you can feel some sort of weirdness because your feet are being pushed and the rest of you isn't. Um, so you feel the force that happens because I move the floor. Okay? <laughs> The floor is not a bunch of tiny little forces pushing all the spaces it can hit, okay? So the floor can't, isn't like gravity, because gravity is going to move all of your parts very close to at the same time. And all these other ways of applying force, like a bullet, isn't going to move all of your parts at the same speed. And clearly it's going to blow some of your parts out at 10,000 miles an hour, and uh, some of your parts aren't even going to know anything happened at all. So how you apply the force is really so essential here. And obviously that's something Newton couldn't really understand. Um, I don't know if he couldn't. That's saying too much. 
Um, but that's where, you know, the big mistake is here is to say all forces are the same. All application of force is the same. Now, I would say all the stuff is really byproducts of stuff moving the speed of light. The little bits are doing all of this work. So if you move the floor, you need little bits. You had to pump some little bits in there to do it. Or you had to take some little bits away somewhere else to do it, to make it happen. Um, and all you're really doing for the electrons and protons, right? So every electron and proton is just in a, a world where it's getting bombarded by force. And all you can do is to the electron and proton is to say, I'm taking away this bit and I'm adding a bit over here. I'm, they're just changing their field. If you change their field, they're going to move as a reaction to the change in the field. So it always gets converted into the little tiny bits. But how you apply a force has everything to do with what you feel. So again, this is just so stupid to talk about what we see and what we feel and say that's physics. Because obviously what we're sensing isn't the whole story. <sighs> Shit. So in this circumstance, gravity is affecting both. Now obviously if they did this technically correct, if she would be in an oxygen environment, the oxygen would be denser at the top and less dense at the bottom, and she would intend to fall inside the box just because the atmosphere in the box would be being affected by the force sooner than she would, and therefore, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, but anyway, you're, there will be a density change, but let's just forget about that part. Just accept this argument. The box moves, she moves because the force is going through the box and hitting her, okay? So that's the way it works. The force is really tiny little stuff and it's just hitting electrons and protons. And that's what it's moving. And it's moving the ones inside her guts at the same speed it's moving her hair, at the same speed it's moving her fingernails, at the same speed it's moving her shoes. All of them are getting pushed. The, little, the bullet isn't just shooting right through her of force. There isn't a bullet and it hits her in the top of the head and just goes right through her. No, the force is spread out over all her atoms. So they're all moving at the same speed. So of course she can't feel the movement because she's being mo all parts are being moved at the same speed. How can you feel it? How can you notice you're moving unless some of you is getting moved more than another part? When you're sitting in your chair watching this video, you can feel the force pushing up on your ass because it's actually doing it. It's actually applying extra force to your ass and not applying it to your fingers and your hair and all these other places except transfer. You have to transfer the energy to my hair. You have to transfer the energy to the rest of my body. That's why I feel it. Do, 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 do. See, this is just so slow. God, it's pathetic. On the other hand, if the box is in deep space and it accelerates. If it has velocity. So again, this is more garbage nonsense. All I have to do is give it velocity to create the impulse that you're going to move in a direction. So what just took place? Well, you moved the box, but you didn't apply a force to her at all. So obviously the box moved, the box crashes into her, and she can move with the box or fall out of the box or roll out of whatever this stupid nonsense is. But the clear understanding is, is I understand that force never got to her. So how could it affect her if it never got to her? It has to get to her by the floor hitting her then inside the box it will look as if everything is falling oh shit <laughs> you saw you're missing all of the fun video my bad sorry I, you know. uh. it's a production you know but it's not very well produced due to gravity On the other hand, if the box is in deep space and it accelerates, then inside the box it looks like as if everything is falling due to gravity. 
so it looks like but we know it really isn't there is no gravity gravity is not pushing her down okay all you have is the opposite force pushing up and it's not the same at all now when we're sitting here on earth it does look like that but that's because gravity is actually doing the pushing down first and forcing us to push into the earth and the earth is pushing back um so the, the comparison is just kind of stupid you've created the push back force that's the one we see and you're uh, you know suggesting the existence of gravity when you don't need gravity if the earth pushed back first right if you didn't i i have to push into the earth for the earth to push back that's the argument right the earth isn't expanding this the, this elevator is, is illustrating an acceleration like if the earth just pushed up and it just kept pushing up well of course i'm going it's going to feel like gravity then because the earth keeps doing it but the earth stops pushing me as soon as it pushes me up it stops it turns off and it waits for gravity to push me in again and then it'll push back but it only pushes back if you push into it so that's where this fails to be an analogy in both cases it will appear to the person inside the so in both cases it will appear so again more of this stuff like oh well it appears well guess what we know better you can know better okay that the appearance really isn't what's really happening just like an optical illusion you can be fooled it's really has nothing to do with gravity because there is no gravity in this illustration there's just a moving box and of course something else in the way of the box is going to be affected by the box moving the earth is not expanding box as if the box is standing still. <coughs> so because both cases look the same therefore it's the same no seems like is like no one of the fundamental principles of Einstein's theory of relativity is that there is no way for an observer to tell whether he is moving or standing still. Right. In gravity. He's clearly capable of knowing it when he's sitting in his chair feeling the earth pushing him back up. So, again, this is stupid. Of course he can know. He can look out the window and see. He can do lots of things. He can, you know, if he's going half the speed of light in his spaceship, he can watch the front of the spaceship being disintegrated by hydrogen atoms and uh, then watch himself get ripped to pieces by little tiny pieces of uh, energy. He can watch the x-rays burn your flesh right off. You know, it'd be very really easy to see how fast you're going. Just see how much of your flesh is burning off. La 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 What a pile of crap, a pile of crap, a huge pile of stinky crap. Blah 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 blah. The world sucks because it's got these fucking assholes, these pretentious douchebags pretending they know something. And they're doing these silly, stupid animations that have nothing to do with real circumstances. Suppose that we try to violate this principle by sending pulses of light from the top. So this is the funny part, right? Because if they do it from the side, it would really illustrate it, okay? You'd really see that this whole thing is a pile of crap. But doing it from the top does confuse a little. So obviously, if you're moving the source away from the creation of the photons, you're creating more distance between them. So if I have a paint bucket, I'm making stripes on the road, I go in the front of the car, in the back of the car, I'm going to get stripes of different sizes. Right? Um, so, yes, the motion away is going to make more distance. The motion towards is going to make less distance. So, it'll all look, it'll all be the same in the end because you have one source that's subtracting distance and one source that's making distance. Up of the box to the bottom of the box. <sighs> la 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 la. Suppose we measure the time between when the first light pulse leaves the top of the box. So the first light pulse, I mean, it's again, it has to be the component of the frequency, you could say. The component of the photon, the first piece of the photon that now will make its frequency. And then the second piece comes out and then the third piece. But yes, obviously, if I'm moving away, 
I'm obviously going to create more distance between these little blobs because I'm adding distance to what their natural distance would be. And when the second light pulse leaves the top of the box. Suppose we also measure the time between when the first light pulse arrives at the bottom of the box and when the second light pulse arrives at the bottom of the box. Yes, well, when you measure that time, you're going to get a distorted answer because you're going to keep moving the measuring tool. <laughs> so you're not going to be able to measure that longer distance created by the other end because your measuring tool is taking distance away. Uh, so anyway. If the box is standing still, then the time between the light pulses at the bottom of the box will be exactly equal to the time between the light pulses at the top of the box. And it will be exactly equal uh, if it's moving. So again, it's just stupid. Obviously, if you're able to add at one end, you're able to subtract at the other end. So they just break logic here and pretend the ruler isn't actually moving. The thing doing the measuring is now moving into the energy obviously it's making just as I've tried to illustrate if I go half the speed of light in my spaceship all of the ultraviolet radiation <clears throat> I'm plowing into is now x-ray radiation I'm increasing the frequency of everything I'm driving into if I hit a little atom all by himself a little hydrogen atom it's equivalent okay to me being standing still and the little atom moving half the speed of light. Well, if I move a whole atom half the speed of light, I have a <clears throat> um, substantial weapon. <laughs> and it'll blow a little hole in my frickin' uh, spaceship. This will still be true if the box is moving at a constant speed. Okay, so this will still be true if the box is moving at a constant speed. Yes, it doesn't really matter. Acceleration is fundamentally just creating velocity. So it is velocity. Now the question is, is you know, if you accelerate going back and forth, then you're not building any velocity. But See, whether you're accelerating or you're just moving, you're going to be creating this problem with photons because the photons don't care what how fast your flashlight is moving. I can move my flashlight away at the speed of light. Well, the photons are still coming out at the same speed. I can move it towards at the speed of light. Well, the photons are still going to come out at the speed of light. So theoretically, if I could go the absolute fastest, if I could go the speed of light, I turn the flashlight on, nothing's coming out. If the box is accelerating, then the time between the light pulses at the bottom of the box will now be less than the time between the light pulses. So again, it won't be blah, 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 blah. This is at the top of the box. It's the same, you, can, you can't change the circumstance. If you move the source towards and you're moving the, I mean, you're moving the source away and you're moving the receiver towards, you can't change anything. Therefore, it appears as if this will allow a person inside the box to tell whether or not it is moving thereby violating Einstein's theory of relativity. Right. Now, so, so if they did the easy one, if they shot the light across the box, that's the easy one because the light won't hit where it's supposed to on the other side of the box. It'll hit lower, and that'll tell you your speed. It'll be just a speedometer right there in your box just telling you exactly how fast. If, the more the light hits lower on the other side, the faster you know that side moved. Activity. Yeah, okay, so there's no, it's violating, uh, not Einstein's theory of relativity, it's violating his stupid equivalency principle, which is a subdivision. It's not really critical. He had no business even going there. There was no reason, there's no, no reason for him to even speculate on the fact that it's all the same. Because it's not, so obviously, bullets are different than... Uh, pushing me pushing you with you know uh, it's all about that pressure thing right I mean if, if I can take one pound of pressure but if I put that one pound of pressure in just one tiny 
piece of chalk, it's going to hurt. Well, a pin. However, if we choose to believe that this one pound of pressure per square inch, if I reduce it to this point of a pin, uh, you're not going to find it a very pleasant experience. However, right, if we choose to believe that the box is standing still, then we also believe there is a gravitational field present. So again, why would you even make that up? There's always gravity. All there is when the, the only thing gravity, okay becomes a noticeable phenomenon is when there's an imbalance in gravity. There has to be more force hitting you from one side than the other side. But there's always force. This box is standing still, then we will also believe that there is a gravitational field present. Why would we do that? So, you know, I mean, this is the weird assumption, right? Everything's standing still and we're going to assume there's gravity pushing down. Why? Why would we say that? Why would we even think that? Why would that even occur to us to say, oh, there's a gravitational field because she's moving to the floor. No, she's not moving anywhere. The box isn't going anywhere. She's not going anywhere. Nothing's happening. Why would I think there's a gravitational field pushing down? This was just such a moment of, what the fuck are you talking about? Why the hell would I make that assumption? That would be silly. So why would you think if the box is standing still, she's going to do that? Why? It doesn't make any sense. I'm just saying it, it overtly doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. The box is standing still, but I'll put a big green arrow going this way because there's gravity. Why is there gravity? Where, where, what, did you show the planet she was near? Where, where's the gravity coming from? This gravitational field affects the rate at which time flows. So again, all it does is demonstrate that when you give uh, radioactive isotopes velocity, they decay slower. And as I've pointed out, I can give you an illustration of how that can be explained, is that radioactive decay happens because of a simultaneous event. A piece of force hits from this side, and a piece hits from this side, and like in Star Wars, they go right into the center at the same moment, and the atom can't deal with it, and it blows apart. It splits in two. Now, if I move the piece of chalk, you can understand that, well, now the likelihood of a simultaneous event is reduced because now less energy can get in this end. Yeah, more energy is going in this end, but that doesn't help my simultaneous requirement, right? So if I made all the energy go this way, you could understand that there's no chance of a simultaneous event because no energy is going to catch up this way, right? So if I made it go at the speed of light, it can't ever decay because the simultaneous event can never take place. So you're just saying, what's the probability of a simultaneous event? And I change the probability of a simultaneous event by giving it motion. So that simple explanation explains radioactive decay and why there's a relationship between radioactive decay and velocity. There. You don't need any woo. It turns out that gravity affects the flow of time in just the right way to prevent us from ever being able to tell whether or not the box is accelerating. Right. So, again, if they shot the photon sideways, it, that's not going to save you. All right. If you shoot the photons, even in Einstein's own uh, a thought experiment, I just don't understand why anybody can't just figure this out. Obviously, if you shoot the photon sideways, you'll not see them hit perpendicular on the other, you know, the right location on the other side of the ship. And because the other side of the ship left while the photons were traveling and therefore that'll show you exactly how fast you're going. So this, it's, this is easily broken, these assertions. The light clock fixes all of this Galilean or, relati or Einsteinian or relativity crapola. It fixes it all because it gives you a standard. A photon is unaffected by motion. It doesn't care. It always leaves an atom. It's a bird being released. The bird is already flying and you're letting it out of a cage. You can't give it any extra speed.
More importantly, you can't take any speed away from it. If we choose to believe that this box is... If we choose to believe, if we choose to do this, if we choose to do that, then we can seems like and looks like and feels like and we can just pretend reality is a pile of wooey shit. Standing still, then we would also need to believe that there is a gravitational field present. So again, he says, she said this so overtly. So if it's standing still, then I have to think gravity is making it stand still. Why would I think that? No reason to believe that. The gravitational field would cause time at the bottom of the box to flow slower than time at the top of the box. Such an incredible pile of crap, right? Because that could only happen if you get, you know, that's the whole curve, you know, to how the effect of dilation, time dilation, affects things. So you'd have to be going preposterously fast for that uh, time dilation difference, the difference between the time dilation at the top and the time dilation at the bottom to make any difference at all. The speed differences would be so the same until you get up to 99.999% of the speed of light. This would cause the time between the light pulses at the bottom of the box to be less than the time between the light pulses at the top of the box. See, that's assuming that the gravitational pull is different at the red end and than it is at the blue end based on the fact that we are going some, like I said, almost the speed of light would be the only place you could get those differences. Therefore, if we believe that the box is standing still, we will get the exact same results as we would if we believed that the box is accelerating. Uh, well, we already did that. We already got the exact same results, and the results weren't what you just said. The results are that you can't tell the difference. Now, in this example, the light, obviously, again, one thing is moving the same amount in the opposite direction. So, obviously, you've done done. The red one's making more space. The blue one's eating more space. They're eating and producing the same amount of space, so it's a net zero. I mean, duh. The gravitational field exists only from the perspective of a person who believes that the box is standing still. The gravitational field does not exist from the perspective of a person outside who believes that the box is accelerating. So again, there's only one reality and both people have to see it. So again, they're just playing this game that somehow you're going to time dilate. So I'm doing the flashlight experiment. Their argument is is that as I approach the speed of light like a bunch of like radioactive decay, somehow all of my functions are going to stop. So even though I'm plowing in to a ton of energy, I'm increasing the energy of the universe preposterously. Now I'm moving single atoms, you know, the speed of light. So I'm giving big blobs of things a piece of dust, given the speed of light, could, would go right through the earth. It has so much momentum. Just a piece of dust. So if I make a piece of dust go the speed of light, its momentum will plow it right through the earth. <laughs> so and I'm supposed to believe that, okay, let's pretend we can do this somehow. Somehow we go in the universe and somehow we go this preposterous speed and somehow we don't hit any dust and we don't hit any hydrogen atoms and we don't hit any x-rays and we don't hit any energy at all, no gamma rays, right? Just imagine how fast the gamma rays are getting now, right? I mean, the x-rays are getting turned into super gamma rays. You know, I mean, ultra f insane gamma rays. Um, you know, in terms of how much momentum they're going to have. The frequency is going to be so small. Um, because I'm plowing into it. So let's just pretend none of that takes place. We have this stupid delusion that the only thing that re is in the reality is my stupid flashlight. And all the atoms in the flashlight aren't affected at all by the fact that they're moving the speed of fucking light. And now they're going to produce light by moving electrons somehow. How can it, something even move? Like the electron, if the electron has to move this way to make a photon, and it's already moving the speed of light this way, how could it even make a photon? It can't move any faster than the speed of light, so it can't move forward. So it couldn't even make a photon. And we're supposed to have this silly delusion that our metabolism slows down and 
we are going so slow that the tiny difference between our speed and the actual speed of light would be just enough for a, the light to travel away, but it would take 10 gazillion, gazillion years. And therefore, the observer saw something different. No, the observer never could exist, okay, in that context. And clearly, the observations weren't the same because the nature of an observation is the time in which you're observing something. You can't say a 10,000 year picture, right? I take a picture where I open the camera and I leave it open for 10,000 years. And then I take a picture where I leave the camera open for one millisecond, that somehow those two pictures are equal. And we'll call that an observation. No, they're observations in very specific uh, context of time. Time has everything to do with what an observation is. So you can't even call them observers if one of them has a 10,000 year frame rate and the other one has a millisecond frame rate. From the perspective of the person outside the box, the time between the light pulses at the bottom of the box is less than the time between the light pulses at the top of the box due to the fact that the box is accelerating. Right, now that you could see at 10 miles an hour kind of thing. I mean, you could measure that, um, you know, at, at realistic speeds. We could measure, especially if we use something other than photons. We just use any kind of thing moving at a frequency. Bullets. We can do that experiment. We could have put a gun on a on a um, you know a launcher that can shoot things going ten thousand miles an hour, and we could have the bullet actually just fall down out of the gun. <laughs> you know we could produce the opposite momentum and just destroy its its frequency, so to speak. From the perspective of the person inside the box, the time between the light pulses at the bottom of the box is less than the time between the light pulses at the top of the box due to the effects of gravity on the rate at which time... I mean, this would be a good one, you know, just even the train thing, right? The difference between a person throwing a baseball to a person on the ground in the direction that the train's moving versus throwing the baseball in the opposite direction of the train's movement and what the person catching the ball is going to feel, right? Because one guy is going to feel... Uh, 150 mile an hour fastball and the other guy is going to feel just about nothing. Blows. Although it is for different reasons, in both cases, the time between the light pulses at the bottom of the box is less than the time between the light pulses at the top of the box. No, it really isn't. They have no proof of that. They've never demonstrated it. It's just what they're saying. Therefore, if we believe that the box is standing still, we will get the exact same results as we would if we believe that the box is accelerating. Well, again, that's true. You get the same results, but not based on their premise. So again, it doesn't make any sense. They said, well, there will be a difference. And now they're saying there isn't any difference. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. You can't change it unless you're saying you can change how much the red thing is moving and how much the blue thing is moving. If they're moving, if they're tied by walls to each other in distance and space, they can't move different speeds. That means one can't add more and the other one can't subtract less. They can only add or subtract exactly the same. It is therefore still not possible to tell whether or not the box is moving. Again, all right, so we'll end there, right? Because again, I, all you do is shoot the photon sideways and, well, yeah, I solved that problem. <laughs> yeah, I can see, I can tell. No problem. The light will not go straight across the ship because the side of the ship's going to disappear and uh, it's going to look like, okay, hey, the light went down. All right, anyway. So, till the next time and such and so forth and whatnot. Blah, 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 blah. Ugh, God. This shouldn't be such an arduous task to have this conversation about just fundamentally. I mean, there's so many assumptions based on no proof. 
I mean, to claim that because radioactive isotopes do something, everything does that. I mean, you, you, you can't honestly just say, well, they really did stretch the experimental evidence there. I mean, that was a real stretch. I mean, I should do an experiment on earthworms. You know, I could yell um, fart face to an earthworm. And then I've proven, you know, because the earthworm couldn't care less, I've proven it's those are meaningless words and nothing could ever be hurt by those words. So therefore I can say fart face to everybody because worms don't react. I, I mean, you know, that's just an analogy, but I just mean this is really bad science. Really bad their science. This crap. Ugh. So, until the next time and such. Meh. Meh.